amazing how many people are tuned in to see you, Rick. I'd have never thought that, but I don't know. What do I know? Glad I finally get to do this. It's been very difficult. You know, I've been trying to get on this show for a while. Well, I've been back. You know, assistant, I, your assistant hasn't been returning my calls, and <laughs> I've had a backlog of guests. You know, I've been trying to figure out a time to get you in, but you know, you know how it goes. You know how it goes. So, what do you want to talk? Let's. You're gonna. I'm asking you what you want to talk about, but I know you're really thinking. You're looking for me to ask you what we want to talk about. So what I'd like to start by talking about is for the people that might not know this, you started playing drums at age 19, correct? I think everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. How many people know that? Let's see a show of hands of people that knew that. Okay. So assuming everybody knows that, how old were you? And I can't believe I don't even know the answer to this myself. How old were you when you did your first session? Like your first kind of, you know, big kind of session or not even big, but session. Like how many, you know, there's a lot of guys that know a lot of these answers um, really well. And I, I just never paid that much attention, but I could tell you this. Uh, it was probably, I was 20. Um, and of course it was Spinoza who called me, got me on this R and B session and the big, R&B station in New York was um, um, WLIB. And I remember playing on this record in the studio in New York and uh, and there were these girl singers and it was a R&B record, of course. It was, uh, yeah, it was an R&B record and for, obviously for WLA because that was the R&B station. It's all we listened to. And um, that and WPLJ, I think. And uh, and I did that session. I wish I could remember the name of the band, but I remember driving down the street about a week later, seriously, a week later. And I'm listening to the radio and on the radio comes that record. Wow. I was like, I was... That's, that gets you hooked right away. Yeah. Wow. And that, so that would have been, if you were 20, that would have been without giving away your age, the late sixties. Ish. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the scene was in New York was definitely happening, but it was, it really hadn't like taken off yet to the level that it was at in the seventies when you were working like, all the time. The, the, the recording scene? The, yeah, the recording scene. Uh, I suppose by the late 60s, it was, it was going pretty it strong. Was, it, was, it, it was, there were a lot of recordings going on in the 60s, but there were different kind of recordings in New York. I mean, and Los Angeles too. I hadn't been to LA yet, but there were a lot of studio guys in LA you know, I, I was thinking about them yesterday, thinking about some of the guys we don't talk to, talk about that often. And for example, like John Guerin, my mm. God, yeah, what a great drummer and what an amazing amount of stuff he did and yeah. really quality stuff. Um, yeah, yep. And a guy like Steve Schaefer too, who I think about as a, like a, yeah. you know, West Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. TV yeah. film guy, yeah. Earl Palmer, yeah. But then in New York, you know, there was Bernard Purdy, um, uh, Gary Chester. Uh, God, I don't even remember all the names. Guys who came before me, Billy Lavonia, and and um, we owed them a lot. They they sort of opened the door for all of this stuff. Mm. So. So fast forward to the, say the early seventies, you were starting to work pretty regularly with mostly a lot of jingles, that sort of thing. Records, obviously. Like what kind of, what kind of, what was the scene like at that time? Um, <clears throat> late sixties, early seventies were a lot of jingles during the day. You'd get up, you'd do jingles starting at nine, 
10 in the morning, sometimes earlier. They would be booked for an hour with a possible 20, actually, is what they used to say. So if you went over, you, you'd get 20 minutes overtime, whatever that was. And then um, you do a couple of those in the morning, and then usually around 1 o'clock, uh, they would start record dates. And then you would do two or three of those in a day. You could be working on three different albums in one day. You could be working on two albums one day. They could book you out for the day for um, a record. Uh, it was uh, it was what we knew. You know, it was basically all we knew. And it, and for you, and, and just so people watching, like for example, for example, Joanne Cassidy and Jeremy Driesen, our friends on the Vineyard, who are watching right now. So, but for you, it all it's like David Spinoza recommended you or, or had you come in on a session he was involved in and that's just sort of you got to know producers and it just started happening for you pretty much right you yeah. started getting the calls and yeah you know at that time the way it worked I tell a lot of people this it was not it was there was no there was there was no thought process going on in my brain about it it was you did a gig and somebody heard you on that gig. And then they would ask you to play on their record or in their band. And that's the way it worked. You, so you started out in one band. So I started out in a local band with um, Spinoza and Jack Grazy and those guys I grew up with who were basically teaching me music in their basements and stuff. And then we go out and we do a gig and then we would like, this was, we lived in Westchester. So we'd be working in the Bronx, Long Island, Brooklyn, New York city. And then you'd go to a gig. Uh, um, and, and, and some other band would be playing, like we'd open the show and then you'd have like the rich kids or the, or the uh, vagrants or another contempt a band at that time, a contemporary band at that time. And they would hear, hear you play. And then, you know, they'd say to the guitar player or to the bass player or to me or somebody, hey, man, you're great. You sound really good. Would you like to work on our record or would you like to do a couple of gigs with us? And that's what that that's how it worked back then. I don't know how it I don't I, I look at the business now and I think to myself, these kids. Um, um, it's just really different. It's really different. So. Um, I'll give you an example. My my close, close friends, actually my ex-wife and her husband, their son, Will Bakula, has this great band. He, he He's from Los Angeles. He's probably 22. And he's he's in he's uh, in Oregon, Washington. Mm -hmm. And he put this band together. And it's incredibly good. And they just work together. They just work and work and work and I just you know I, I just hope that he um, um, he keeps the band that band together and they just go up and up and up because I don't and I, I said to Chelsea I said she's just that band is so good everybody in the band individually is really good I hope they can keep the band together because I'm still thinking about the old days when if you had a band that was that good it was hard to keep it together because Somebody else was trying to poach somebody from your band. Sure. Yeah. Like the bass player in that in in in, in Will Bacula's band is phenomenally good. I mean, he's the best bass player, best new bass player I've heard in a really long time. And he's a very serious player. He, he plays um electric, but he's he's a really he's a trained, upright player and he's really good. And and I said, Chelsea, I said, geez, I hope. I can't remember his name now, but I, I just said, I hope he can stay focused on the band because people are going to be trying. I, I, I can't, you know, I could see Chick Corea, for example, coming in and mm -hmm. saying, hey, yeah, we'd love to have you play in the band. But wouldn't you say nowadays, though, that there's more of a, by the way, I just want to say hello because I, I want you to know that Joe Vitale and Chris Parker are watching. Oh, great. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I just now said, I want to get, now I don't want to talk anymore. Why did you have to tell me? 
<laughs> and Stanley Sheldon, your ba- your bandmate. What the hell is wrong with you? God. I'm just trying to make you even more nervous, Ricky. Just that's I'm how I work. You me. I'm, I'm just I'm humbled. I'm twisting I'm the knife. I'm not nervous. I, there's nothing I like more than talking about myself. But I I'm humbled by those guys, Vitaly yeah. and Chris Parker, and yeah, God knows who else is on here. Jeremy, Jeremy Stacy. Oh, forget it. Goodbye. I'm hanging up. Yeah, and I said Stanley Sheldon is watching, and and uh, Stanley's girls. my bandmate. I know. Yeah, he's your bandmate. Um, and we, I want to talk about Stanley in a second because. I think people would be interested to know you guys are bandmates going back a long time with Ronan, but also um, with Peter Frampton. But um, what I was going to say is just what we were just talking about when you're saying nervous about him getting poached by like a chicory or somebody, I get the impression now though, that, that unless you're, unless you're in the Dave Matthews band, which isn't even really a young band anymore, you can't call those guys young, but it's kind of like there's the mentality is really more of a, uh, um kind of a it's not so much about being in a band as it was when you were coming up you know about 30 or 40 years later when i was coming up maybe more than 40 years later i don't know um but you know you wanted to be in a band but it it's it's kind of like and i only say that because you see a lot of people out there just doing their own thing you know playing uh, cover songs on on uh, Facebook or Instagram or or uh, YouTube, you know what I mean. So I don't know. I, I just didn't know if you had any, if you get any vibe from that, any feeling about that, as as far as like the the idea of being in a band is that kind of a lost art in your mind? Do you think? Or you know, I tell you, it's funny you should ask that question. Um, I don't know how interesting this is. I I I started out playing with the guys I grew up with. And then I got poached and I got into this band called Brethren. And that was a band. And it was, I was playing in an R&B band, like 10 piece band, um, um, obvious horn section playing all Joe Tex, Sam and Dave, uh, uh, J- James Brown, uh, just all R&B music. And then I'm in this four piece, actually three piece band started out three piece band that started out to be the vagrants in New York city and, and put everything into that band. I mean, it changed my life, it changed my perception of music. I hear, I come from R and B and they, that's exactly what happened. We were doing a gig and we played in our band and then um, brethren played, but they were the vagrants at the time. They didn't have the band brethren. I actually named the band brethren um, or came up with the name. And then the the next band that played, if I remember correctly, was the Strawberry Alarm Clock. So when we played, the guys in the Vagrants were standing there, and there was a drummer from Paris. I think his name is Roger. Roger. He was the drummer from the Vagrants, and the original guitar player on the Vagrants was Leslie West. So Leslie left the yeah. start Mountain with uh, Felix Papillardi. Uh, Felix yep. Papillardi. Uh, yes, Felix Papillardi. Yeah. And, and they were now, they replaced him with this guy, Tommy Cosgrove. Tommy, Stu Woods, and I formed Brethren. They asked me to play in the band. And um, and we then went to California and we did an album. And Dr. John played keyboards on the album and wrote the liner notes. And it was a phenomenally good band. Uh, probably, certainly one of the best guitar player singers I ever worked with. I mean... It was an incredible band and we could not keep our shit together. It just, no matter, we had management that wanted us. We had premier talent behind us. That's how I met Peter Frampton. Then I met Stanley because it, we were on the road with Humble Pie and Free and Brethren was a bill. And we did the whole East Coast. I remember we would go down to Florida and every night someone would, we're all sort of the same, coming up at the same time. So they said, okay, you guys, we're all with premier talent. And they'd say, okay, one night Brethren opens, another night Free opens, another night um, uh, Humble Pie opens. And, you know, there's three incredible, incredibly good bands and, and, um, and all really young guys. We're all 21, 22 at the time. And um, that's where I met Frank. 
Um, okay. Who okay. then, yeah. but the, the, the point I was trying to make is when that band broke up because of all of the stuff I went through in that band emotionally, because I was very immature, you know, I wasn't, I, my, 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 sheltered and I think I was just immature, still immature. But I, I, I remember when the band broke up, I remember saying, because my dad had said to me, he said, Rick, you don't ever want to be part of something where the chain, you're on, you're in a chain mm. and, uh, and there's a weak link in that chain because you're only as strong as that link. And no matter what we did, I mean, I fucking remember putting Tommy up against the wall. I was just, come on, like, let's get our shit together. And it was just this, if someone doesn't want success in a band, that was my experience. The point of the whole story is that's what made me say, I don't want to do this anymore. And that was really early on. And the way that I got out of it was, was between Dave Spinoza and you know, I don't always really talk about this. On the second Brethren album, we hired a percussionist in New York named Ralph McDonald. The first album we did in L.A., second album we did at Electric Ladyland. So I'd see, it's like wow. Hendrix was in every day. He'd come in and, hey, what's going on, guys? You know, it was a totally different <laughs> scene. And so, so we hired Ralph McDonald to play percussion. Wow. And, and Ralph said to me, hey, man, you're coming with me. I remember he literally said that. He goes, it's, we just locked. You know, as soon as we started playing, we locked. And he goes, you're coming with me. This is way, this is really early on. So, I mean, literally, it's Brethren's second album. We still were together. And the band broke up after that. And I remember Ralph called me and he said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And you know what? I stayed away from bands. I only was in bands as a, as a, like a, Ralph got me into Roberta Flack's band right there. From right away. Yeah. He called me one day. That whole insane thing. That was, getting into that band was crazy. He literally was, was out on the road and called me. I was in my apartment in New York City and he called me and he goes, <laughs> pick up the phone and he goes, get to the airport. What? To get to the airport right now. Don't ask me any questions. Just get to the airport and get a plot. Just book a flight to Newport News, Virginia. We're playing the Hampton Coliseum in Newport News, the Hampton Coliseum in Newport News, Virginia. And so I grabbed the trap case and went that in those days. I just got in a cab and went to LaGuardia, got on the first flight I could get to Hampton to 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 um Newport, Newport News, Hampton, News. whatever yep. it was. And I um I remember I get out of I don't know if I told you the story before, but I get out of the, the I get there, I get to the airport and I get a cab and I say to the guy, I've got to go to the Coliseum, the Hampton Coliseum. Oh, you're going to a show? I said, I think I am. So <laughs> he drives, he drives and it's a circular place. And I told him the story and he goes, Don't worry, we'll get it. So he pulls Yeah, you told me this is great. Yeah. He pulls the car around and he runs into some door. He goes, just wait here. He runs into some door. He comes running back and says, wrong door. He goes, let's go. He drives, he drives to the other door. And I went to pay him. And I go, well, where are you going? He goes, I don't know. I go, I go come on. You want to go to the gig? So we both went into the place. And when I walked into the Coliseum, it was full. I don't know if there were 15 or 18,000 people in the place, but it's like playing the forum or something like that. You know, yeah. the place was packed. She had already started. The drums weren't set up on stage. And I look at Ralph and he's looking at me like I'm standing there with my trap case and he's going, get up here. And so I get up on stage while she's doing like some really quiet, you know, it's Roberta Flack. Yeah, killing me softly or something. Yeah. No, no, not killing me yeah. softly. You hadn't done, done done that yet. It was like um, first time I ever, last time I ever yeah. saw your face, or first time I ever saw whatever. And she's doing something like that, and yeah. and just but very quiet. Might have been just a little quiet thing. And I see all the guys in the band are looking at me, and they're all laughing. And I'm putting 
<laughs> kit together. It's unbelievable. It's your worst nightmare. <laughs> no, and I'm putting the kit, the kit together, and I look, and uh, and it's the band was uh, Jerry Jamont was the bass player at the time, and it was um, Cornell Dupree and Eric Gale both, Ralph McDonald, Richard T. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Chris Parker was just asking if T was in the band. If yeah. who? If T, if Richard T was in the band and Eric Gale and, and the, the gang. Of course, that was the band. It was the original yeah. stuff band. Yeah. And so, uh, like, the by the middle of the second song, I just start sliding in. And I remember Eric Gale and Ralph just said, look at us. That's it. But I knew I, I was such a huge Roberta fan that I knew Reverend Lee. I knew um, uh, the the one with that uh, Howard Howard um, Johnson had done the tuba arrangement to um, Gone Away. I think the name of the song was. Um, I can't remember. All, all I know is I knew that I knew pretty much all the songs from being listening back then. I used to listen to everything. So. Uh, that that started that, you know, and 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 the way it came about uh, was, um, oh Chris, Chris, who played drums, who produced the Stuff album? I, I'm so I'm so embarrassed that I'm forgetting this. Maybe Chris can tell us if he's still if he's on here. If he writes, he, to you, let me know. Yeah, Jack Douglas is on as well. Um, let's see. Hi, Jack. Let's see if Chris got that. You're asking who produced that stuff record or produced stuff records? Yeah, produced produced stuff. It was a drummer. It was um, maybe Jack knows. Uh, I remember your early days in the studio. Great groove and unique vocals. Hi, Jack, that? you could. That's Jack Douglas saying that. He he could be exaggerating about the vocals, though. I think. He's just <laughs> oh, J Chris is saying Herbie Lo Lo Lavelle. Herbie Lavelle. Thanks, yeah, Chris. Herbie yeah. Lavelle. So what happened was Herbie Lavelle was the drummer in the band um and the reason i got the call from the airport was because when they got to the airport to go to newport news herb who was an incredibly great guy really nice guy and a great drummer he punched a sky cap and got arrested at the airport. <laughs> that's how i got that gig oh my god yeah <laughs> now chris is saying tommy the puma i could <laughs> Um, oh so, man! So so that's how it happened. Is Herbie Herb got got arrested, and that's when Ralph called me, and then they hired me to do the gig. And Herb was Herbie is, didn't have any real problems because he was doing a lot of sessions in New York at the time. But it was towards the 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 uh, the, uh, the the last years of his uh, really working a lot. Yeah. See, the, that's what's wrong with the business now. There's not enough people punching each other. It's just it's become a little too <laughs> pedestrian or something. Uh, uh. But I, I want to jump back too because, and, and this is my own personal um, selfishness, not selfishness. Hold it, Jack's got a comment here. He's saying he sang or grunted while he played. Uh. James, James Cena and I used to solo it out and crack uh, up. <laughs> you know, I was going to call James Cena today actually and tell him <laughs> I was doing this because I wanted him to come on because here's what I think. Here's what a suggestion I'd like to make. I think that you should start talking to guys like Jack Douglas and like Jay Messina, the guys that were our, absolutely. they were yeah. sort of our, they were the pie and, drivers. They were the guys that Kramer. Yeah. Jack, Jack yeah. was, Jack was in the studio when I did uh, John Lennon's record. Jack was producing and went through the whole thing. I still remember the day I went in and, and, and I walked in with an SIR t-shirt and I was early because I was really hyped to do John Lennon's record. And I walked in and John Lennon and Jack were at the, were huddled at the control at the board. And I'm just standing next to them. And I have an SIR t-shirt on. For those of you who don't know, SIR was a rental and delivery company in New York City and in LA and in Nashville. They did everything at the time. Yeah. And so yeah. I had this SIR Studio Instrument, instrument Rentals. Yeah. <laughs> and I had the SIR t shirt on. And 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 John is talking to, to Jack about something. And he looks and says, Yeah. Then they're gone. And I'm just standing there, you know, like five feet away. 
10 feet away. And he finally turns and he goes, can we help you? You can just leave whatever it is in, in there. And then Jack said, John, that's Rick Marotti. He's the drunk homicide. <laughs> It's a moment like great, you know. <laughs> well, thanks, Jack. <laughs> that, oh, that's Rick Marotta. He's he's the drummer in the session. He's gonna, be, he's gonna be one of the many drummers on the session. Uh, I'd love to get Jack, yeah, and James Cena and Eddie Kramer and any of these guys that would be Jack they would be have amazing. so many stories. I mean, Eddie Kramer produced the second Brethren album. So he was there in the trenches with me. And yeah. that's, when, that's when I met Ralph McDonald. And Jack, I, if you're still listening, Jack is, I mean, the John Lennon stuff, the early Aerosmith records that are just like masterpiece records, you know, that stand up almost you 50 know, years you later. You know, he mentioned Jay Messina. Jay is a great, another great New York engineer. And we all came up at the same time. I remember working with Jack a lot at the record plant, I'm pretty sure, and uh, Jay at the record plant. And those guys were just, they were like studio guys. They were like us, you know, they could be doing a jingle. But then Jack and, and, and Jay kind of got so busy, they became more part of a band. When they did a project, they were members of, basically they were members of the band. As producers and engineers yeah. they come up as engineers, but they're musical guys, they're producers. And then there was where we were really lucky because we're playing with guys in the room. I always felt incredibly privileged to be playing in the room with um, guys like Human Crack and, and Spinoza and Chuck Rainey and uh, Tony Levin and Anthony Jackson and Richard T and Ralph, you know, on and on and on. I saw, yeah. you know, yeah. I was thinking about the studio scene. I actually was talking to Jerry about it yesterday. And I said, I said, cause Jerry, uh, Jerry called me, we were talking. And I said to him, I said, Jerry, are you doing anything? Cause I was just concerned because of this horrible, horrible situation we we're in that nobody's working. And I just wondered, you know, had he, had, I talked to Jerry a lot, but, had he been working and he goes, you know, Jerry, you know, Jerry very well. It's, it's like not yes or no. It's work. What are you talking about? What work? What kind of work? Work? Like you mean studio sessions? What? Because there's certainly no like I said, Jerry, I know, but he's so gifted and he's so equipped. You know, Jerry is, yeah. do you call Jerry and you go, Jerry, I need a drum part. Well, it's everybody's like this now. Guys get, you're not in a room. We we when he we we started talking about what Jerry and I started saying. We're never in a room. He goes, "When is the last time you were in a room with a bunch of musicians playing mm. a song?" And right. honestly, <clears throat> probably when I booked the session, you know, probably on the on a kids' record or something that I've been working on, and um, and yeah. not 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 that often. And it's it it is fun, but you never get to really do it. Anymore. I mean, some yeah. guys do. I, I, I guess, uh, um, uh, but it's really hitting hard. Although I just spoke to Harry McCarthy a little while ago, who said all of a sudden, you know, you had Harry uh, uh, on a couple weeks ago, yeah, two ago, um, <clears throat> with Jeff Jonas, and um, <clears throat> Harry said, it's "Busy, it's busy. Studio oh. stuff opened up." In, no in Nashville again. Yeah, he's bringing he's bringing instruments to, um, he's bringing instruments to the studio. Drums. Uh, he said Garth Brooks is doing a record down there. I think I don't know if Keith Urban is doing something, but they're going into the studio now. That Nashville seems to be the last bastion of of um, live recording. Yeah, um, for the most part. I mean, there's certainly other things, but it's a, it's kind of the norm there. And uh, yeah, he said that uh, they started up working there again. I personally, I think it's early. I wouldn't want to be in a recording studio, but um, um, yeah, it it, uh, it seems like it would be too soon. But you know, different places are doing it differently, and and uh, hopefully, it's not going to cause a spike or you know a resurgence. So hopefully, fingers crossed. 
you know, yeah, it really it is, it really is a, a horrible thing what's going on. I don't have to tell everybody, don't have to remind everybody. That, yeah. <clears throat> but it's tough. Wait, so and I want to just I'm going to jump back for one quick second because I, I just sort of touched on this at the beginning when we talked about how you started playing at age 19, which is pretty, you know, all the drummers or any musician out there watching, I think, would think that's, you know, later than a lot of people start. And you just kind of just had an inkling to want to play the drums. Right. I mean, you just kind of I didn't know anything. else. I didn't have anything else going on and never took any lessons. Right. You just. Listen, started playing by ear, listening to yeah. records and yeah. And what were some of the so what were some of the records that that you were kind of listening to at that time that you were getting influenced by, like the uh, the bands or the drummers well, from that time? It, it was so I was listening mostly to um, um, R and B stuff. Yeah. Like it was, it was, it was Sam and Dave. It was Otis Redding. Um, uh, just that whole genre, it, the Temptations, uh, the Four Tops. That was, that was what I was listening to all the time. Mm -hmm. Then, the person that we don't talk about as much as often as I think we should is. Um, Um, uh, Andy Newmark. Andy Newmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was well, thinking about Andy. Andy. <clears throat> Andy was playing in 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 Spinoza's band. Uh, there were several drummers in 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 Dave's in the bands that we were both in, but Andy Newmark was there. Um, a couple of guys uh, got drafted and sent away in the army. And um, uh, there were four or five, there were some really good drummers in Westchester where I grew up. And, but Newmark, I became really good friends with Newmark when I first started playing. And he turned me on to the Young Rascals and to Vanilla Fudge. So mm -hmm. was, for me, it was a whole other thing. And he would say, listen to Dino Danelli. And you know, you'd look at Andy Newmark play and Andy would kind of copy, you know, Andy sits yeah. sort of rigid upright like this. And he kind traditional of traditional grip. <clears throat> yeah, traditional yeah. grip. And he would copy um the looks, Dino Danelli look. And he was a hero, uh, drum hero, Dino. He was a he was a superstar. Absolutely, absolutely. And Andy used to cop all those fills, and you know, he would try to show me stuff and 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 and, and so. That was influential, and that's what I started to listen to. And then we went to see, you know, I went to the Capitol Theater once to see the Vanilla Fudge. So it was Vanilla Fudge, and here was the band. It was, oh, shh. And I have a question in the queue from Chris Parker to talk about the groove and the hour that the morning comes, James Taylor song. So, but, but, but I just, I'm just going to. Table that the, question the, for a minute. The bill, the bill at the Capitol Theater was Charles Lloyd mm. and Vanilla Fudge. Wow. How do you put that together? Yeah. It made no sense to me, and yet it was phenomenal because I think Jack DeJeanette was playing with Charles Lloyd at the time. Not, not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure it was DeJeanette because I think it was the first time I ever saw Jack DeJeanette play. And I thought, wow, what is this guy playing? And that was when I was introduced to sort of quote unquote free music. Yeah. Yep. Which I would which which I was taken taken I had taken a stab at with um with uh Dave Liebman and uh Annette Peacock uh some couple of years later and I and I realized <clears throat> free that free jazz kind of music was was not where my brain was because I was always looking for that thing where you can play the groove. And I never really understood where it came in, 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 in that what quote unquote free music. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, do you want to talk for a second about the uh, the groove? I know that we're kind of jumping around, but before um, the question goes away, we don't see it again. Chris Parker, the great Chris Parker. Oh, Chris, Chris, our good friend, asking about the uh, the groove that you came up with for "Hours That the Morning Comes," James Taylor song. I, 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 um, I will talk about. I'll answer anything that Chris wants to know, but I want everybody to know how much of an influence Chris has been on me as well, because I've known him since he was just a kid, an upstart coming up in New York. And he and Will used to play together all the time. Yeah. Um, so, so hour that the morning comes, I, I consider it an inch. I like that groove. I really like, I like that it's recognized somehow because some people found out about it, maybe because I told them about it. But um, <laughs> we went in the studio we were working on an album, Dad Loves His Work, James Taylor album. And um, James came into the room and he, the way we worked at that time, you know, it was Waddy Wack, Tell Me, Dan Dugmore, the guys in Ronin, basically. Yeah. Um, Stanley, I don't think was there, but it was either uh, Lee Sklar or Bob Blau, probably Leland. And, um, you know, that was it. Billy Payne or somebody or Don Gronick, Don Gronick. Um, whose birthday it was just recently, and I, I miss him. I can't tell you how many times I think about this guy. So, so anyway, to answer Chris's question, that was, so I'm thinking, James came out and played that guitar part for us to learn the song. That was what it was. We didn't write, it wasn't written. They, um, they, they, they had... Uh, just James would come out and play something. And, you know, James is an incredible guitar player and he plays very differently. So if you listen to the guitar part, you're going to hear him playing that finger picking style, that picking style of his, with all these really incredible voicings and all this kind of stuff. So um, James played it. And if you listen to the record, just, just listen to his guitar part. Mm -hmm. Okay, so while he played that guitar part, I just sat there and I could hear this sort of, it wasn't like bar one, it wasn't four bar groove or eight bar groove, it, it, or well, it wasn't a two bar groove, a one bar groove or two bar, it was like an eight bar or a 16 bar groove. I just heard this whole line yeah. of movement yeah. that's, that to me, I felt was going to stay in the groove. I hope this is making sense to Chris because it's starting to not make sense to me. But, but as it went along, instead of playing just boom, boom, bap, boom, 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 bap, I had listened to what he played. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. So yeah. I'm thinking, I'm going to play that. And it was complete opposite of what I had been told, uh, what I had gravitated towards playing wise, which was simple groove, don't play melody drums. Melody drums was something I was trying to. I didn't like melody drums, personal right. taste. I right. felt it was more like something. I don't want to name any names in rock and roll bands. But there were guys that played melody drums. And so I couldn't help it. I just had this, this melody in my head that I wanted to play. That was almost, I hate to use this word, contrapuntal to James's thing. So it kind of worked with him and against him. So I kept feeling like this was happening the whole time I was playing. And then I, we, we took, we did a take. Mm. And then they said, let's try it again. I th think we did two or three takes and everybody turned around and went, that's kind of interesting. That's yeah. And I was over the moon because I'm figuring they're just not going to go for this. Right. And I was totally over the moon. And our really good friend, Danny Korchmar, who we all know and love dearly, Danny comes in, Cooch, as we know him, 
producer. And, right. And he says, this is a great song. You guys have to redo it because the drums are all over the fucking place. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I got to say, I got to say that I was sat around going, at the time, my, my basic disposition was not nice. I was, at that time, I was working a lot and I was just, dumb. I didn't want people telling me, what, oh, and blah, blah, blah. So I just said, okay. I just didn't want to ruffle any feathers. I didn't want to cause any problems. So I, um, I went, okay. And we recut it. And I tried really straight. Bah, do, bah, do, bah, just played. Bah, do, boom. And, and Cooch, by the way, at this time, now Cooch is playing guitar on the thing. So we started all over again from scratch. And Cooch and Wadi are playing guitar. And I'm playing, you know, straight ahead drums and playing like I thought a James Taylor song would be played, you know, because I didn't invent the stuff on James Taylor's stuff. That was Russ Kunkel. Russ Kunkel invented the approach to playing on a James Taylor record on those on, um, uh, on um, fire and rain and those records where Russell yeah. was yeah. just like, I listen to those records. I mean, that's how you play. That's how you play dynamics. That's, so, oh, so, so anyway, I was really depressed. And P Peter Asher, God bless him, because James bought into it. James said, That's right. Yeah, Peter was well, yeah. Asher, yeah. James went, Yeah, we better cut it again. Yeah, you're right. The drums are, because he did, James, I don't know. He just, I don't know if he really understood it or liked the part. I don't understand it. But he, he went, he, he said, yeah, to coach. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. And everybody else was really supportive. I remember Wadi. Why is it very boom, boom, Stanley Sheldon will, will tell you boom, 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 kind of guy. But you know what? You better play it right with Wadi because he can hear if you're off a of fucking hair. He can yeah. tell if the feel is not right. He can tell where the time is. He's crazy with that stuff. So Wadi was into it. Wadi was like, he can understand it. Wadi understood it. So once I knew that Wadi liked it, I because because he was he, he used to really do a lot of directing with bands. And the end of the story is we recut it, I don't know, two or three takes the other way. And they said, Yeah, this is great. Um, we're good. And I went home feeling really depressed. And I find out Peter Asher walked in and said, You guys are out of your mind. We're going back to Murata's original drum part. We're keeping that. That's on the record, period. He did it, and James acquiesced. James said, okay, yeah, you're right. It sounds really great. And that's how that happened. But the approach to it, to, and back to Chris, I hope I answered you. You know, Chris, one of the things I thought about was I had been listening to Keltner and this little dance that he did you know chris and i go way back so he knows the way i play chris and i've played together and so we're, we're we're very much like this um chris knows that i'm a sort of funky knuckle down and dirty kind of player i like to play from the bottom up and i always think when i was listening to keltner i was thinking keltner likes to play from the top down and mm. so i went i'm gonna play good way to describe it yeah i'm gonna play sort of inside out I'm going to go top down, bottom up. I, and, and that was really what I was just trying to make some crazy kind of thing out of it that worked. But I made sure that it was repetitive. I played these certain little things that I that were that were inspired by James Taylor's guitar part because he would play them. I would play either again counter to them or with them. And I would repeat them so that this, the arc of the groove, instead of it going like this, the arc of the groove went like this mm. and then like this. But in the middle of that thing, was, the thing was going like this. So great time. I hope great that, part. Chris, I hope that that explains what I was thinking because it was not anything that, that you or half the guys here wouldn't do or come up with. It was just thinking about the part and then letting it flow. I mean, it was more like like learning the vocal to a song or the melody to a song. 
and just playing. You know, it's interesting talking about Chris and all the guys in New York. We've been doing this for 45 minutes and we haven't even mentioned Steve Gadd, which is good. Because who, who wants to mention? Who, who wants to mention? Yeah, exactly. Um, somebody's been knocking at my door. I, I Give me just one second, Rick. I want to just let somebody in who wants to say uh, hello. Whoa, whoa, what do you know? Oh. Speak of the devil. Oh. <laughs> oh. You know. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> it's over. Game is over. He's not in. <laughs> this, ha this happened very last minute. <laughs> Your old friend wanted to say hello and, and uh, maybe tor torment you a little bit. Guy, uh, talk about poaching. This guy can't let me do anything. He's always close up. I'm texting. I'm texting John. He said he's in the middle of a story. I'm going. It's a long. <laughs> how long is this story going on? And then he's telling me to be patient. <laughs> Rick, Rick, you know, you know how impatient he is. <laughs> Talk about impatient. Oh. I just, I just knew what you'd be doing if the, if you were, if the tables were turned, man. If you were waiting. <laughs> Yeah. No, Steve, if I knew you were waiting, I'd still be in the middle of that story right now. I know. I know. I had to be very careful when I texted John. I tried to jump ahead, jump ahead, jump ahead. I'm trying to get him to move it along. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's like. So, for people who don't know or live under a rock, uh, Steve and I go back a really long time and so honestly one of my big influences was is right there steve but i don't mean it in a way like you know you listen to bernard purdy or you listen to to peter erskine or you listen to jim keller or any of those guys i'm talking about we would be literally playing together in a band on a session or in a band and he would influence me this way. He would turn to me and say, stop playing that. Don't play it like that. Play it like this. Be a drummer. Don't be a bum, which is what you are, let's face it. What? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 it's, and, and here we are. Look, what, look where it got you, man. <laughs> yeah, you're in your house in the vineyard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say hello, man. No, don't, this is, you know what? I was saying to John, you know what would be really great? I, I'd rather than do this. I'd rather do it like, do do a few with Steve, like 20 or 30 of them with Steve. And then let's just do one, me, you, Listen, and Steve. <laughs> I see where this is going. I see. Where this is going. And yes. <laughs> You remember, I was trying to do this when I was still at Zildjian. I was trying to, before I knew about Zoom, I didn't, maybe it didn't exist, but I would get on the phone with you guys and or at Groove Night after a rehearsal and we'd be in catering for an hour with you guys telling stories. And I used to say, guys, we got to figure out a way to record this shit or, or get these stories out to people because this is like, it's the, some of the funniest stuff, but it's also some heavy stuff too. We had some, we had some, we, we had some good times. <laughs> We've had some laughs too. Man. A oh, lot man. of laughs. Yeah. Steve, and Steve. stories about, uh, stories about, <laughs> I remember stories you told me about Harry McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, Harry, Harry just told me one about you the other day. Okay. Well that, but we'll, we'll talk about that another time. We'll catch no, up. This yeah. is a good one. It's really quick. All you right. Well, in a session and then Harry, went in and, and, and not a session, you were on the road, and the next day you went out to play, and Harry had changed your heads. And he said, he said I'll yeah. never forget it, I changed the heads. And oh, he changed the spring on my pedal. No, he changed, yes, it was either the spring on your pedal or it was the strainer, it was the I strainer. think it was the snare wire. The strainer. The the strainer. Wire. Yeah, yeah. The strainer had about four snares on it. <laughs> It sounded just the way you it liked it. Me. But it was so good. So I saw it and I put a new 
snare string on the bottom end, and he starts playing. He's going, he goes, Harry, did you do something? Yeah, I the screen, the snares were broken, and and I put new snare. Why'd you do that? Well, just just drum maintenance. And you, he said, you said to him, guys like me and Rick don't need drum maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> it's right, man. <laughs> they start to sound good after you play them for a while. Yes, guys yes. like yeah, guys like, like me and Rick, Rick don't, don't need. need so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how uh, you you doing good now at the venue? You must be so good much to, better than Miami. Yeah, I can see like, you're doing not, well. It looks like you haven't. Did you lose your razor? Is I got to shave. Yeah, <laughs> I got to shave. I'm not letting it go though. I just I just let it go too many days. I gotta I gotta so, do. It. So I have to say, for people that don't know this, Steve and I do go, really do go way back. And it's, we're family. It's family to me. We we don't talk about uh, drums all the time. We talk about all the stuff. We talk about everything. But my real yeah. name is Steve Gad Murata. We're... we're uh, <laughs> We're brothers, man. Come on. Yeah. You know, somebody sent me a podcast of a comedian yesterday. Just just yesterday. And this friend of mine from LA said, Rick, you gotta did you ever hear of this this co- comic? And I don't I don't remember his name now, but he's a very popular comic. And this guy's son was listening to him. And in the middle, he just sent this podcast to me. He said, just go to go to the 15 minute 15 of this podcast. I mean, I go to the podcast because you know it's telling me to do it. And he's a friend of mine. And I don't want to not do it. And I go there and it's the guy starts talking about um, playing. He's, he's a drummer. I mean, he's a comic, a comic and he's not doing any gigs. So he's practicing drums all the time. And he goes, and I'm playing to the song, you know, and I thought it was I, this, it was this Jim Croce song. And, you know, I'm listening to this great drum, drum track and I'm thinking, yeah, Steve Gadd sounds really good on this track. Then he goes, but I find out, I don't think it was the great Steve Gadd. I think it was this other guy named, hold on, let me, hold it. Rick Moroda? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was, and it turned out to be the great Rick Moroda on that track. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think, I think I think how how much Steve, Steve haunts me everywhere I go. The great oh. Steve Dad. Oh. I miss you, man. I wish that we could hang out. I wish we could too. I wish we could too, man. Uh, I just want to double check something. Do you have well, your? I got mine downstairs. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I was, uh, I just stopped using the mask for Zoom meeting. I was, I was using it for, I don't even, I think, I don't even think Mike Landau is taking calls. He won't speak to anyone on the phone. <laughs> uh, you know, and also prevention. <laughs> see, we should, we should, next time we do this, we should actually come up with a, uh, uh, with an agenda, what we're going to talk about. And Steve and I will try to get through seven minutes, five to seven minutes, without just going off somewhere <laughs> and laughing about something else. It'll never happen. Uh, we, we can try it, though. We should try it, but it, I can't. You know, a couple of things people should know. <laughs> I've known Steve a really, really, really long time. And the first time I saw Steve play, first time I heard about Steve, was from Spinoza. They had done a gig. I'll make this really quick. They had done a gig. I wasn't in the band. I wasn't even playing drums at the time. Dave came back from this gig they had done in like Rochester, I think, where they were playing as the band Giant or or Soul, whatever, Soul Company, whatever the band was that we were in. It was a company band playing. And and, um, uh, Steve, who was it that... uh, that was the headliner. Marvin Gaye. Oh, 
Marvin Gaye. So Marvin Gaye is going to be playing, and they're going to use the band that Spinoza's that band. Yes. Spinoza was the front man. He wasn't even playing guitar, man. No, but he had to play guitar. He had to play guitar because they brought charts for Marvin Gaye. They had to play guitar. Dave had to play guitar because the other guitar player couldn't read. And, right. and Dave, Dave could read. So Dave played guitar for Marvin Gaye. And the, but the trumpet player, Lenny Colangelo, in the band was so intimidated. He said to David, David, will you please take the trumpet and just pretend to play it? Because I'm afraid. I can't yeah. read it. They were afraid, and Marvin was so nice to these guys. Oh, it was they, David's band, and and David taught them all the, the parts, all the horn parts, and everything. None of them read, and and Marvin conductor his his MD wanted wanted those guys to play the charts, you know, <laughs> and, and 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 Marvin rehearsed. He, Marvin was really nice, man. It was. Uh, but that's when I first met David, man. It was cool. Oh, that's Dave told me, funny. Dave said to me, we went there and whoever was playing drums with, with Dave in the band at that time, I'm sure it was not Andy Newmark, probably Billy Reed or one of those guys. Right. They, they brought, they said, we've got to bring this local kid in. They, so Steve shows up with his father. Father takes Steve to the gig, came with him to the gig. Goes up and 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 he was you know, Steve's a lot older than me, so I mean, a lot. <laughs> but he, he brought his dad and and Dave, I remember Dave came back and said, Rick, this guy came in and didn't play. He he wrote, read everything from top to bottom, not one mistake. He said it was the best drummer he ever heard, and I said. Who was it? He said, his name is Steve Gadd. I said, we'll never hear about that guy again. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a second. So then I then I go to New York. Because that happened uh, uh, well, that I in, when I was in I was in college. You were in that, was in the, that was in the 60s. So that, that, then after I finished college and I, I go in the army for three years, I go to New York and I'm doing, you know, I started getting called to do some jingles and we were doing one, some, some and David was on the session and all of a sudden, man, he remembered that we had met before. Meanwhile, he's one of the busiest session guys in town. He's producing. He's had a he had a record deal as an artist, and Rick grew up with him. Rick's in his band, you know, yeah. and Rick is his go-to guy. And I'm just coming out of the army and coming to New York, you know, and or, and and my background is more, you know, jazz and and uh, and I did orchestra in, in school, but I didn't know. I, I hadn't been around pop or or people that really, you know, knew about the pocket, you know what I mean? And I went and heard uh, after David and I reconnected and realized that we had met before. You know, he said he was playing downtown at, at a club and it, the band was uh, Rick, um, Stu Woods and Kenny Asher and David. And uh, we, I went down and heard this band, and man, this, it was so on fire, you know, not in like a, a the groove was just deep, and the yeah. crowd was just with them, you know what I mean? It was just so nice to be, it was great to be involved in that kind of shared energy, you know what I mean? And the and the music was great, and it made me want to be able to. Uh, do that stuff, you know, and it's, you know, it, it, it looks simple, but when you try to do it, I mean, it really took, you, it, it took a lot, you had to really want it and love it and mean it, no matter how simple it was. And that's what I, I you know, and that was what Rick uh, inspired me uh, to do, you know what I mean? And, um, and so I devoted, you know, that's a, a lot of, I mean, I'm devoted to the groove, 
no matter what kind of music. And, uh, and it's because of hearing Rick and, and, and David and that band. Um, I remember Marvin Stamm was, was in the crowd that night, and he came up and played, you know. Marvin's like an old jazz guy and was like, a, but I mean, you know, no matter what kind of musician was in the club, the, the groove was so strong, it didn't make any difference what kind of music mm. they played, you know, so. That's, that's very nice of you to say, and I appreciate it. Two things and I then, to- And then you took me and played uh, the meters and introduced me to Keltner, because I, I asked, you know, Remember you, you started playing me stuff and we, we became, uh, you know, brothers immediately. And, uh, and, uh, and the, our passion and the thing we share is the love of great music and, and there, there's nothing like the groove, you know, there's nothing like that. So um, I remember, yes, and I remember that I got a call from Spinoza and from Mike Maneri and then Tony Levitt all saying, you got to meet this guy. You and Gad have to, you got to meet each other. You guys are really going to get along. You're going to really like each other. And, um, and we did, but I remember it was, it was so intimidating to me because I had seen now my story for seeing Steve was I didn't see him live first. I saw him play, there was a, a video, a concert, Chuck Man Joan concert. Gat Man Joan, I think, was playing keyboards. Chuck Man Joan was playing trumpet. I think Tony might have been playing bass. Yeah, friend, it was Friends in Love, probably. Friends in Love. It was an, but it was it was like a with an orchestra, right? Yeah. Oh my God. And I watched Steve playing groove, and he wasn't playing like he played his own, he was like, it sounded like a guy who invented his own way of playing a groove. And I was like, holy shit. How do you even think about that? How do you even think about coming up with that kind of stuff? And then I met him and I realized he wasn't really that smart. It was a lot, a lot of accidents happened when he played. And- <laughs> yeah, and I, what you mean, I mean, it's like, it's, it, it, you know, I appear to be a certain way, but people that know me really know. <laughs> it's all a happy it's accident. Story. <laughs> you know, this, this is, this is fun. And I, I want to say, I watched the, I watched the, 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 the Steve Gadd interview that John did when I did not butt in. And the highlight, the highlight, the highlight for me of that interview was when Steve told a joke about a dead monkey, and I hear Daryl in the background yelling, "That's terrible!" <laughs> that was the highlight of the interview. That's he got, terrible. He got reprimanded. Well, you guys should tell a quick story, if it's possible to tell a quick story or a long story about some of the stuff you did together. I know, like, the plastic um, plastic Yoko, plastic Ono band, yeah. or or other stuff that you guys have done. I don't there, know, just... each, there are so many stories. <laughs> there were stories where we're playing in the plastic Ono band, and Steve wasn't playing. He was just... He was just not playing. There was a point where we were in Japan with the plastic going up in. I look over and and Tom Grolnick, God, God love him, is having coronary on stage with his his hands like this, one arm up in the airplane. And we I look over and and Mike Mike Brecker was off. We we're supposed to be playing. He's off stage. And Bre- Mike Brecker used to play a lot of practice a lot in a corner remember steve where mike would always be playing scales or something it sounded like coltrane meets michael brecker in a corner he's playing so he i you can see him off stage he's practicing in a corner somewhere and randy is also supposed to be playing a part randy's playing organ like this on the other side of the stage and Japan, Japan, organ was on one side of the stage that was on the other side so it's he was laughing so hard. Steve was laughing so hard that he wasn't playing. It was just me playing. I'm yelling, play, please, play something. 
Grolnick, Grolnick is going to, to, to the Brecker brothers. <laughs> and, you know, what I remember, what they were doing, they weren't practicing. They were sitting, they didn't have to play, so they were sitting at the organ. And all, all Grolnick could hear was them noodling and, and his fucking monitor. And he's going... <laughs> God, I think he ended up taking the monitor and throwing it off. <laughs> so, so you want to hear, you really want to hear great stories. This is going to be the Gad and Murata stories. They're, yeah. they're just stupid, crazy, laugh like you can't believe stories. And they're just treasures for me because they're things that I get. I get to remember and think about even if I get them wrong. And I just, it just, it just, I'm couldn't be luckier than to have lived through that period. And with these guys playing with all of these guys and, 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 and Steve and Chris and, and, and the Brecker brothers and Gronick and Spinoza, those days are so, and Trope. I mean, when we did Trope's records, they were, and the live days. Yeah, the we had oh man, and it wasn't always it wasn't always a walk in the park. You know, there were times. One of the great things, and I was really thankful for it, was I always looked up to Steve because I always felt like, you know, he didn't deserve it really that much, but I always felt he was much better. <laughs> you always felt he was much better what than me? Oh, than you? Yeah. So I was. I would defer to him, and we had this thing. Steve, Steve, it was like we had we had to develop this thing somehow when we would play where we would, if I played something, he would listen for a second and he would start to play when we played together. And it wasn't the same. It was this, this complimentary thing. It was like he was playing percussion and we had percussion. So it was this thing where we would play and we'd always come up with parts. And sometimes he would start a fill and look at me and I'd know it was coming. And I would end the fill. Or I would start a fill, look at him. I'd start, it was back and forth, back and forth. And, um, and it was smooth, but yeah. not always smooth. Sometimes I remember, I remember he would yell, what the hell? hell are you thinking <laughs> and i'd be like what what did i what did i do he has what the f you playing sometimes something? i had to reprimand him yeah that's what it is, that. He needed, yeah, that is i had to reprimand him that's all i can't say it any other way that's the only other way i could i can't put it any other way he reprimand him sometimes he don't <laughs> he would say things like, "You know, there are two of us here." You know, so I said, "Like, you know, like I had to reprimand him one night." Say, "Rick, could you show me how to do that?" <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no. You know, it reminds no, me would, when you we guys would learn, we would learn each other. We would put, you know, <laughs> it was fun just playing together, man. Yeah, I love the way you played, man. It reminds oh. me of when you guys did the one of the last Yamaha Groove Nights. You guys played the letter together oh. at the end of the night. Do you remember that? And you and you you had it was like a contest to see who could play the softest. Quiet. I remember you, you were <laughs> play who could play the quietest. The quietest. So yeah. Playing the letter, which is da, 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 yeah. da, da, two drummers, and he goes. He we start to walk out, and he goes like this. He picks up brushes. He goes. <laughs> He goes, he goes, I'm going to, let's not, let's, he, first he goes, let's not try to overdo this. Let's just, you know, uh, let's try to keep it you know, mellow. Yeah, great. Okay. And then he goes, brushes. <laughs> so I get to the drums and I pull up brushes. And he says, I'm going to play soft, really soft. And I said, I'm going to play softer than you. He goes, no, I'm going to play softer than you. And then at one point, he was like, I'm not going to play. <laughs> oh, man. Man. It's like the finale. It's a closer. And the band's yeah, the last time. And they hear. <laughs> and I remember looking at the horns. They're like, they're 
chomping at the bit. Got Murata and Gad playing. This is going to be a no. But then, but then I the shit back. was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked back, and and it really did turn out to be. He, Steve was doing this brush thing, and I was doing this thing, and it was like here we were all over again, like when we were kids. We were just like coming up with stuff, and it was really, it was really good. It, it was, was really, really good. good. But it was yeah. scary because I know him so well. When he goes, I'm going to play quieter than you. No, I'm going to play. And then he's not going to play. <laughs> that He goes, I'm going to be so quiet. No one's going to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Steve, you know, I got to tell you something real quick that I forgot. Jerry, my brother Jerry has been going through all of these tapes and stuff that he found somewhere that he took from either the apartment or my parents' house. And he pulls up the, and he sent it to David and I. It's the it's a reel to reel of the gig. Me, Stu Woods, the night you were there where Marvin Stam got up and played. Really? Yeah. So I he's baking it. those tapes. I, I I don't even know where he found them, but he because of because of being stuck in his house He's been doing a lot of, um, you know, cleaning, going through stuff and baking tapes. Oh, we should check that out, man. That I'd be afraid to because we already, it can't be as good as you said it was. I think I'm going to have him burn it. No, it was great, man. We had, we had, a, we should check it out. We should check it out. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to let you guys finish up. We're, we're all done. I think oh, that you're done. We, we, how long, what time is it? We, we can, let's go a little here. longer. Rick. Let's go a little I'm longer. I've got to make dinner. There's no one. I'm on my own. I got to cook dinner for myself. It's only four o'clock. It's uh, you can wait a little while longer. All right. Okay, yeah, we'll but it's going to be boring right. as hell when Steve leaves because this is what he likes to do. He likes to step in. You know what he used to do? He's, he just, just, he's a disruptor. He just, let me say one other thing, okay? When we were first coming up in New York, and I was kind of getting pretty established as a studio player. Steve wanted to come to town and, you know, you're gunslingers and everybody has their little ploy that they do where, so where I'd be at record plant or someplace doing a session. And all of a sudden Steve would walk in with his stuff, his, his cymbals, snare drum and sticks. And he'd walk in and go, Oh, Hey, hi guys. Oh, I must be in the wrong studio. Who's on drums here. Oh, is that Rick Morata? Hey, yeah, I'm Steve Gad. Rick and I are really good friends. So by the way, for all you young drummers out there, you want to start getting work. There's a really good way to do it. Pretend that you walked into the wrong studio when someone else is doing a session. You're going to get their sessions pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I used to do it to him too. When he was like a child. I walk in the center room, I go, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in By the, the way, I used to do it to me. I I never knew how to do that until I saw him do it. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is, neither one of us ever did that. <laughs> I, I, would, go, I would go to sessions, though. I went and saw him play at... Uh, remember when you were doing Jerry LaCroix? Yeah. I came and heard that, the, you know, that's after we first met. That was a big bonding for us. Anyway, it's great to see you. Um, Jack Douglas is asking if we remember Donald McDonald. Yeah, I remember yeah. Donald McDonald. That was, but you used to play in a band, White Elephant. Didn't didn't you play in White Elephant with with Donald? Yeah, with Donald, right? Yeah, yeah. what a band that was. That's Dave right. Matthews. Did Dave Matthews do the arrangements to that? No, Mike Maneri. Mike Maneri. Wow. Anyway, yeah, Donald McDonald. All right, Rick. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll talk to you later, man. Hey, man. Great to see you. Love you all. Talk to you, Steve. All right. I see hey, you. Thanks later. for thanks for jumping in. Talk to you later. A right. much older Steve Gadd is leaving right now. John, I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> okay, Steve. Steve thanks Steve for later. jumping in. Oh. <laughs> okay, that was that was pretty funny. Do you want to call Steve and tell him how to sign off? I'm not sure he knows. How <laughs> no, he knows. I I taught him earlier how to do it. <laughs> well, look, I can't follow that. I think that we should yes, just. Th there's nothing to follow. I think I think that was a, a nice little mid segment. We we got hours more to go here, Rick. Hours to go. Oh, we, got, we got seconds. We haven't even 
We, we haven't even got to popcorn yet. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to pee soon. You're going to have to what? We're going to have to. Oh, popcorn? Popcorn. <clears throat> tell that story. That's a great story. You got to tell that story. Uh, popcorn. I don't know if anybody here knows that. Well, I was going to say people should Google that. Google that song. The band was called Hot Butter, right? Yep. Yep. And the song was called Pop. It was two brothers. It was two brothers in in New York. I wish I could remember their names now. I'm so sorry. I don't remember. One was an engineer and one was kind of like a synth player. And then Joe Mack was a bass player who I had done, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of stuff with, with, um, with um, Jim Croce, actually, Joe Mack. And it was a great, great bass player. And, uh, and so... We went in and just three of us. Was, and they I think they had it all, they had already recorded the the synth part. And back then there weren't really synths. So it was way ahead of its time. And it was this yeah. something like that, right? I remember it. Joe, <laughs> Joe Mack and I are there and we're going like, what the hell is this? And I had just learned how to play a samba. <clears throat> I was just learning this, this, this uh, South American samba sort of stuff. And, and Joe Mack looks at me, and he was a prof total professional, but he was like old school professional. He was an older guy, really nice guy, and really good player. And you know, he'd write the stuff, he'd play it. And he was really, he was really good, but not outside the box thinker that I can remember. And I said to him, and he looked at me, and he goes, Rick, what are we going to do on this? What do you want to do? And I said, what if we play a samba? That was it. We played a samba. But the, 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 then, I mean, to me, that was a samba. Basically, it was a marching, kind of like my introduction to samba. Like a... Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that kind of thing. And, <clears throat> and it became a number one hit, you know, flash in the pan. There wasn't a real band. It was, they put out a record called Popcorn by Hot Butter. And uh, <clears throat> instrumental. In total instrumental, yeah. And, yep. it, and it was three of us. And I always think to myself, I made $60 or $90 for the session. And it sold... I don't know how many millions it was in movies. It's been everywhere. And I just think the, I don't want to get on a high horse about it, but I think yeah. the inequities of, of the business are that guys that worked on stuff like that right now, there are a lot of guys that can't pay their, their, their mortgages or can't pay their rent. There's really good players and it really bothers me. I'm, I'm, so far, I'm lucky, you know. I, I I moved around a bit, and I and I didn't put all, all my eggs in the in the <clears throat> in the recording studio basket. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there are a lot of guys that did, and that bothers me. It bothers mm -hmm. me that there's no looking back. Nobody looks back and says, "Wait a second, we have to take care of these guys that took care of us for all these years." Right. <clears throat> yeah. No, I know. I know. We've talked about it and, and uh, you know, you, Steve, Chris, Andy, you know, made so many, I mean, oh so many guys. I mean, yeah. Jeff, I mean, all the guys, all these Jeff, records. They that, are. I mean, there's yeah. one after another, after another, after another, after another. I'm not trying to blues about myself. I'm saying there's guitar players, bass players. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, Anthony Jackson, when he did that song, Money. You know, yeah. he played bass on money. That, yeah. to me, the song is money, 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 and it's don't. That's him. Yeah. Well, that's the song. Yeah. Those guys, those guys appreciated it so much, said, you're getting writing, writing credit on this song. I don't know how much of a writing credit he got on it, but I do know that I always felt good about them for that one reason. And I, mm -hmm. I just thought that that was deserved. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Well, we got a question uh, from a little while ago, and um, I'm, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And I, I see this man often on these chats, and he's a he's a great guy. I don't know him personally, but his name is Laser Brendan. Thinking that might not be his birth name. It could be though. But he's asking, and you and I were just the other day talking about canasonic drum heads, and he's asking, do you have any stories about using them on your snare? <clears throat> matter of fact, you do, I think. We just talked about that. So, yeah. um, this I can so think of one song on Maybe. Peg. I had gotten this. Um, um, Paul Kimbrough might be. Paul is Paul Kimbrough on this thing, or did he go? I, I he might. He's probably still here. I I, I, had, gotten, saw him I had gotten a snare drum from Frank Ippolito. And Frank yeah. told me that I bought the snare drum and it was a Slingerland snare drum. And he told me that it was Buddy Rich's drum. And, 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 and Frank, who had the pro drum shop in New York, he yeah. was friends with, with all those guys. He was really good friends. He was old school. Grady Tate and um, uh, 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 Buddy Rich and uh, all those guys. The same all year. those guys, yeah. Yeah. So, so he said, Rick, I got this great snare drum here and it's Buddy's snare drum. And I said, oh, great. Yeah, let's see it. And I really, I hit it. I really liked it. I brought it home. And that was when I used to tinker around with drums. When I, like I originally, you couldn't get two headed eight or 10 inch tom toms. And I right. put them on my drums. Then I put them on Steve's drums. Then he went to, to, to Japan and, and he came back with the drums. So, so anyway, I got the the the, the drum from from, uh, and I think Paul was working there at the time. I'm not sure. I think Paul Kimbo was he's, working. He's still here. He says, "Yep." Still um, so, so I took the drum home, and like an idiot, I took the. I didn't like the throws, the snare throws, but I had been playing. I'd been using Ludwig drums earlier on, and. I had a Ludwig snare and I got the Ludwig snares, the strainers, and I attached those to the drum. I put in new holes, I drilled it, and I took it yeah. apart and I put, a, I think, a diplomat head on the bottom if they had them at the time, and I put a canasonic head on the top. And the drum had a very unique sound. So I'm doing a Steely Dan album and I walk in and I'm almost positive I brought that drum with the Canasonic head on it. And as I was playing, we're doing peg. And Walter Becker, I was it was at is that it was at a it was at AR Seventh Avenue in New York. And Walter Becker was pacing behind me as we're playing running down that track or whatever track we were playing that back and forth and I'm playing and I, I turn on <laughs> Walter, what's going on? He goes, I don't know about that snare drum. And I think he might have heard me say to somebody, I'm gonna I got I brought the snare drum that I you know I've been futzing with and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I turned to him and I went, Walter, it it really it sounds really good. And I remember Elliot China said, Walter, calm down. Snare sounds great. And um uh, Roger, I don't think said anything, and that 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 was, that was good. But that's where I used the, in answer to your question. It was on on that on that um, session. And and what I session did you use that drum for probably thirty years? It's been. If anybody out there sees a gray or white is it a pearl what was that drum uh, the, the, the yeah like a uh, like a uh like a marine pearl kind of yeah yeah that that has ludwig throws on it that's my drum and i would love to get it back someday i've been looking for that drum for ever it disappeared from my trap case well maybe that's seriously really somebody will walk off to yeah Hmm. Well, maybe somebody will see this and 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 know where it went. 
or maybe someone accidentally found it in their case and they might say, Hey Rick, I think I have your drum. Yeah. Yeah. That would be nice. Anyway, that's it. I used to, I, but I didn't use Canasonic heads all the time because they were a very dead head. Um, and I could get them to crack. Uh, and I was getting, sometimes I was getting things. I think Elliot li liked it because it, it cracked, but it wasn't too high pitched. Right. So, so I remember them being very muffled sounding, which yeah. was the sound in those days. Yeah. 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 So you didn't have to dampen yeah. the head so much. Yeah. Plus, Elliot Shiner was engineering, and, you know, very difficult to make, um, to make, uh, to sound bad with Elliot doing the engineering. He was, he was really good at it, as was Jay Messina, as Jack Douglas, all those guys, Shelly Yakis. We were in New York at the time. They were all great. They were all, they yeah. all knew. And they, had, they, they, they didn't have a lot to work with. They had great consoles, but the drums, a lot of times, we didn't have like L.A., you could bring your own drums. You went in and they were basically drums that you would you would jury rig. Going to talk about a couple more quick songs that <clears throat> you and I talk about all the time. That I'm assuming a lot of these guys will know, but maybe they won't know um, that you played on that are that are I think <clears throat> people talk about Peg, of course. And they, Charlie they, Drayton just said I didn't take that drum. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie might know where it is, though. Yeah, he might. He might. If Charlie puts the word out. I saw Charlie was watching earlier. Um, but you played on the first Steely Dan song you played on was Don't Take Me Alive, correct? That was um, the first one that scam. Yeah, might have been. It was one of the first ones that I heard released. But I played on a bunch back then, really a lot of them. Right. I don't know right, whether right. they came out or where they were. But um, yeah. Don't take me alive. Yeah. Don't take me alive. Cause I, you know, that, that to me is anybody who doesn't know what, doesn't know that song, you, you got to listen to it. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's a, it's a great song, but it's a great representation of Rick's playing and um, you know, other songs that, that uh, in fact, I have to remind, so people watching know this, I have to often remind Rick of this song because he often forgets about it, but it's a Boz Skaggs song called uh, Breakdown Dead Ahead. That's a, just a, a, a great, great, I tried to get the Marotta Brothers, um, the band that Rick has on the Vineyard every summer, which maybe might even happen this year, maybe. But uh, the last three years, Rick's had a band on the Vineyard with his brother Jerry on drums, um, Joanne Cassidy, who I think might still be watching is the singer, and uh, John Zeman on guitar, Zoe Zeman on bass, um, a uh, variety of keyboard players in and out. <laughs> That's kind of, no, no, no. Uh, no, you've got. Um, Sam. Yeah, Sam. Sam Roth, Rothberg is a, the steady guy now. Sorry. Yeah, he's a, he's so a regular guy. I, that's one of my big, that's a big drag. This year, I went back to playing a lot more. Stanley and I are back doing gigs with Ronan. We went to Japan. We did a live album. I wish we had um, we had time to, to do more stuff. And we did. We did the live record. As a matter of fact, I was just listening to some of the stuff here um, and really enjoyed it. I mean, it was great to get back with Stanley and, and with Wadi Wachtel and Dan Dugmore and with the Murata Brothers Band. I mean, that band is so much fun. And Joanne Cassidy is just scary good as a singer. And I'm on Martha's Vineyard where I go, you go, well, I didn't even know who she was, honestly. And I thought I knew everybody here and I was skeptical yeah. she is unbelievable and and i miss that that band because we had so much fun we moved from a place called lola's last year to the pa club the portuguese america club here and um <clears throat> and uh i'm just enjoying it and so much more back to playing and been playing a lot more and i remember i was in japan <clears throat> and uh steve so Danny, the guy that works for, for, for Yamaha, fantastic. Greg Crane from Yamaha here in the States set it up with, with, with Danny in Japan to take care of me. And he takes care of, 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 of Steve when Steve goes to Japan. And he was unbelievably good. I mean, the drums were perfect and he was right yeah. there next to me. And, and so Steve sends me, and I'm playing with, uh, with, um, with Ronan in, in Japan. And 
Steve texts me. Um, he goes, Danny's there telling me you're tearing it up in Japan. And I write it back to Steve. I text him. I said, oh, man, I'm really nervous. It's humbling. I, I, I feel rusty. And Steve writes, writes me back, yeah, well, you got to practice more than twice a year. <laughs> He's got a, I tell you that. I tell you that too. So anyway, um, that, <laughs> I hope we do this again sometime. And if anybody has anything, if I offended anyone or if I left anybody feeling like they were left out, I am so sorry. And, but I, I, I respect you all. And I'm so glad to see some of my old friends on here. If for me, this was like a social visit that I haven't had in a long time. And I'm really glad to have done it. That's great. Thanks, Rick. All right. Well, uh, and we will do this again, you and me, and we won't let Steve, you know, um, jump I want in. Steve and... back. I want <laughs> Steve back. That was a treat. I love that guy so much. Uh, me too. Me too. All right. Well, hang hang tight. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye, everybody.